I'm Corey Smith, uh, Senior Director of Supplier Diversity, Strategic Sourcing, Diversity and Inclusion, and a whole bunch of other stuff at Major League Baseball. Um, some of these faces are familiar, which means you guys sat in um, when I did this in Pittsburgh earlier this year. Um, these folks apparently, well, I don't know. I guess they thought it was good enough that I should come back and do it again, but maybe not so good that they cut my two hours to one hour. So I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure how to take all of this, but, but we're gonna have some fun with it anyway. Um, look, this is, a, this is a conversation that I don't think happens often enough or is starting to happen more in supplier diversity where we talk about how unconscious bias impacts supply chain. Um, on the DNI side, they talk about unconscious bias all the time, right? In terms of how your thought process impacts hiring practices and who you hire and the reasons why you pick the people you pick to work in your organizations. Um, we don't really talk about it from the perspective of supply chain or how we pick suppliers because most of us want to really believe that it's super objective and we just go with the low bid and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, no. Um, so there are reasons we do what we do and why we do them, and, and we're gonna explore it a little bit today. I'm gonna have to speed through this. Um, last time I was kind of able to take my time and, and, and really dive into it. It also really sucks that the laptop is all the way over there, and every time I'm gonna need to advance, would you, oh, that, my man, <laughs> appreciate you. So he, he, was, he, was in he was here in February and we did it in Pittsburgh, so he kind of knows the spiel. So that's the other thing. Part of this is super interactive. Um, we're gonna sort of play a game to get introduced. Um, and those of you that sat through it the first time, obviously you can't play, because you know all the answers. Um, so um, let's, let's get started, if you, if you don't mind, appreciate it, and thank you so much. You gotta know what you're doing, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, you should be able to just hit the arrow. There you go. Yep, there you go. Um, all right, so how thought process and unconscious bias impact supplier diversity. Look, I think where we start with um, is the fact that everybody has a bias, right? Like bias is simply based on your experiences and the things that you've gone through. Um, the second part of that and what they really try to focus on from a diversity and inclusion perspective is everybody is diverse because diversity is just your own uniqueness, if you will. So I'm not gonna get on a political soapbox here, but you know, in today's society, people reduce diversity to just gender or just ethnicity or race, but diversity is everybody. Um, what you like for breakfast may make you more diverse than you realize. Um, in my house, I'm the odd one because I put syrup on my eggs. And my daughters and my fiance look at me like I've got 13 heads. They're like, who does that? I like it. I learned it when I was a kid. My eggs were next to my pancakes. Some syrup got on my eggs. I like the way it tasted. <laughs> I just kept doing it even if there's no pancakes. But that is my unique experience that I have carried forward with me. That is my bias. So. Bias, diversity, all of these things are really more of a thought process than anything else. And again, it is based on your family. It is based on your education. It is based on the block you grew up on um, as a kid. It is based on the things your parents taught you or didn't teach you as a kid. This has very little, actually to do with the color of your skin or your body parts. And all of that is a factor as well because based on that, then you go through more unique experiences. But to reduce it solely to that, you're actually limiting your biases <laughs> from a certain perspective. Um, so we're gonna play a game. And I did this last time. So again, you guys that sat through this last time, you cannot play. Um, You've all formed biases since you've walked in this room, right? There's things that have happened since you've walked in this room that have triggered thoughts in your brain. You 
may have sat in a session in this room last year for something completely different and maybe you hate this room. Maybe it's too cold. Maybe it's too warm. Something has happened since you've walked in that door. Maybe you got an email that has caused your thought process to go in a different direction that is now shaping everything that you see and hear and do from this point on. Everybody with me? Okay. I did this last time. You guys can't play. <laughs> Everybody take a look. Because you've all formed biases about me since you've walked in this room. Okay? So you got me. Everybody's looking at me. Everybody thinks or has assessed something about me since you've walked in this room as the presenter. So we're going to take a little journey about me and we'll see if your biases are correct. Fair? Those of you that sat through this last time <laughs> cannot play. Um, all right, if you will, please. I'm not black. Well, I'm black, but I'm not black. My family came from Panama. So in certain circles, I'm Hispanic. Who thought I was Hispanic? Not a damn person in this room <laughs> thought I was Hispanic. <laughs> Nobody. Bias. <coughs> Right? So we're already wrong. Everybody. Oh, well, not the ones that sat through this last time. Um, my parents came from Panama. Now, there is a huge black population in Panama. If anybody knows the history of Panama, a lot of the folks from the Caribbean islands went to go work in Panama when they were building the Panama Canal. So Panama has a huge black population. Um, so my ancestry is Jamaican and Trinidadian and from Barbados and from all these islands. I'm a mutt, but Caribbean mutt. Um, but technically, my parents and their parents were born there. They claim Hispanic descent and they claim African descent. Um, my Spanish friends say, you're not Spanish enough. My black friend says, you're not black enough. <laughs> That's their damn problem. Those are their biases. <laughs> Not mine. I claim both. I own both. My Spanish kind of sucks, but I can hold my own. Um, first bias, right? Um, so then my parents came to New York. My mom came to go to college. She got a scholarship, um, then went on to get a PhD. She taught at Co uh, um, Queens College. She became an author, a consultant. She was an entrepreneur. She did all this fabulous stuff, like incredible, incredible woman. My dad never finished college. He went two years and stopped. Um, he worked for an auto parts store. So when my dad came to this country, he didn't know any English. Any English. He only spoke Spanish. Only job he could get was sweeping floors. Um, swept floors for a while for these guys that own these auto parts stores. They had a fran couple of franchises in New York. Decided to sell one of them. And my dad and another co-worker of his, this Italian guy, so you've got this Spanish guy that doesn't speak any English and this Italian New Yorker, they get together and they buy the business from the owners, who were Jewish. Um, the name of the store was Jacoby Auto Parts. Jacoby, <laughs> super Jewish name. The Spanish guy and this Italian guy buy this one store and it now becomes Gil, the Italian guy, and Bob, Roberto, Gil and Bob Jacoby Auto Parts. Italian, black, Spanish, Jewish store. <laughs> the neighborhood at the time was predominantly Italian. Over time, the neighborhood changed. It went through a super Hispanic phase and then a super Asian phase. This is from the 60s until 2000. Um, the store did well. The landlord, it was a storefront. It had two apartments above it. The store did well, but the landlord kept raising the rent. My dad said, screw this, ponied up some money, he bought the whole damn building. So at a young age, I learned about entrepreneurship, right? Well, one, work ethic, right? From going from sleeping on the floors to owning a building. Um, didn't know it at the time. I was a kid, had no idea about supplier diversity or diversity or minority ownership or any of that stuff, but my dad was doing it. What I knew was entrepreneurship sucked because dad worked six days a week, it was never around. My bias, I never want to do that. 
That was dad providing for his family. My bias was anybody that owns a company is never around for their family. See how that works? So that began to shape my mind. Um, these two wonderful people provided an awesome life for me. I did 12 years of Catholic school, from first grade till senior year of high school. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> what that did, actually, we won't get into the religious aspects of all of this. Um, really, we won't. <laughs> um, but. It's interesting how things you don't even realize are shaping you, shaped it. When I got to college, so I went to Columbia. Um, when I got to college, I became an instant clothes magnet. Because I spent 12 years wearing a uniform. <laughs> I went nuts. I bought anything and everything that I could make the choice for myself. <laughs> Bias. Didn't even realize it was influencing me. 12 years of wearing the same crazy blue, horrible material pants, right? <laughs> so now I dress in Armani. Um, <laughs> but I didn't realize it was shaping me. Had no clue. Um, the second part of this that I want to touch on is, and I'm, 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 I have friends that are Ivy League snobs, right? Like, I'm not, kind of. Um, <laughs> my guidance counselor told me I would never get in. Um, guidance, counselor, guidance, <laughs> said I would never get in. Um, meanwhile, I had a 95 average and was like in the top 4% of my graduating class. Told me I would never get in. At a Catholic school, so she was a nun. I, we're not going to get into her analysis as to why. I think it's racial. I don't know that. Um, so it was awesome when I got into the School of Engineering. I was able to kind of shove my acceptance letter in her face. But again, I got to keep this moving. So we're going to move on. Um, <clears throat> graduated, first job. So my degree was, undergrad degree was in mechanical engineering. I knew I didn't want to be an engineer. I just knew I was good at math. And I hated writing papers. Um, so when you're an engineer, you only have to take like one semester of English or something, and then you're done. Um, but I didn't get any engineering jobs. I think the closest job I got to an engineering job, there was a company that like built boats like on a harbor in New York. And I knew there was no way I was doing that for the rest of my life. So luckily, landed up at IBM. IBM at the time had a manufacturing plant in the middle of Brooklyn, Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. Now, I don't know how many of you are from New York or know Bed-Stuy. When I graduated, Best I was one of the worst neighborhoods in New York City. Um, IBM, in the 60s, under the Kennedy administration, had struck a deal with the government that they were going to build manufacturing plants in predominantly minority neighborhoods. And they built this plant in the middle of Best Stuy. This plant, at the time, was literally 98% minority. Everybody that worked there was black and Hispanic. They were literally like, for white people. <laughs> um, but it was awesome. This was also the 90s, so IBM started this downsizing. They were going to close this plant. It had been open since the 60s, had a great run, was doing awesome things. Um, but it was just one of the plants that was selected for closure. Um, the employees got together and bought it. At the time, this is 93, it was the largest minority-owned, employee-owned what are those called? ESOPs, right? Employee shared, but yeah. Largest minority owned ESOP in the entire country. Um, and they struck a five year deal with IBM that IBM would downsize the volume. It was a, manuf it was a repair plant, so they fixed IBM monitors when IBM actually still made computers. Um, fixed IBM computers and then refurbed them and got them back out into the, into the world. Um, had a five year deal with IBM that the volume would downsize as they, as a new company, would pick up new business. Another bias. At this point in my life, I'm, I'm fresh out of college. I still don't know what supplier diversity is. Still don't know what minority ownership is. I just know this company that's now run by a bunch of black people is making a bunch of news. Still don't fully get the concept yet. Um, but again, was technically already doing supplier diversity and had no clue. Um, I was in 
So a bunch of the employees left to go with IBM. Those of us that stayed, we were now a brand new startup. Technically, again, before the word startup even existed, right? We were a startup. Um, and everybody now was doing everything. So I came in the company as an IBM employee as like a production analyst. Um, when the switch happened and I stayed with the new company, I got some big fancy title. All of a sudden I was like the manager of logistics. I'm like 22 years old at this point and I'm managing 40 people. All of them are older than me. I, they had kids older than me. Um, but I was in charge of inventory control, purchasing, shipping and receiving, warehousing, um, and production scheduling, which is making sure that the products hit the manufacturing floor on time. Um, that's where my procurement career started. The company grew too fast. I'm speeding through this because I got limited time. The company grew too fast. Um, we opened a second plant in Dallas when we shouldn't have, and we were burning through our cash, and there wasn't as much business coming in, so the company started to fail. And I'm sitting in procurement trying to figure out how to pay vendors when we don't have any money coming in the door. And the packaging guy is like, I just shipped you a bunch of boxes to six your, ship your computers out. <laughs> and I've got the parts guy that sent me all the little transistors saying you owe me some money for those. And I'm literally robbing Peter to pay Paul every day. Um, the CFO left and I knew it was time to get the hell out. <laughs> so I left. <laughs> um, and I went back to my alma mater. I worked in their procurement department. I got a job at Columbia working in their procurement department um, and was doing big campus-wide deals. I did their deal with Microsoft. I did their deal with Apple um, for all of the campuses. The main campus, the health science campus uptown, um, literally the entire university. I did the furniture deals for the dorm rooms, for the office buildings. I did everything. Um, so really learned contract negotiation there. It was while I was there, because employees get to go to school for free, I lucked out, I got into the B school, I got my MBA from Columbia. <laughs> um, did that for a while. Once I got my MBA, I kind of plateaued there. Went to go work for Altria. Altria at the time owned Philip Morris cigarettes and Kraft. So I was hustling cigarettes and mac and cheese <laughs> every day um, in procurement. So while I was at Columbia, I, I, got, I missed a step. While I was at Columbia, um, that's when I first heard the term supply diversity. Columbia, you look it up online, it says it's in Morningside Heights. But those of us that are from New York know that the minute you cross 110th Street, you're in Harlem. I don't care what you want to call that name, but they call it all kinds of things. Morningside Heights, Man Manhattanville, they got all these fancy names. You cross 110th Street, you're in Harlem. Um, Columbia wanted to start a local program for vendors. They were already doing business with a bunch of vendors locally, the local printer, the local whatever. Um, the fact that they were in Harlem meant most of these businesses were actually diverse. So we started a supplier diversity program out of procurement. Didn't do much. We just counted what we were do already doing. I didn't, wasn't really super proactive. Um, and in the first year, we almost hit a million dollars and we, were, we weren't even intentionally doing it. We were just spending money locally. Um, so again, left there, ended up at Altria. I get to Altria and Altria is part of the billion dollar round table. And I'm like, what the hell? Um, they were already doing a billion dollars a year with diverse vendors. Um, so I went from a really small starting a program, not knowing what the hell I was doing, to a company that was really ingrained in supplier diversity. Um, between Philip, Philip Morris was doing about 500 million, Kraft was doing about 500 million, and then the parent company, Altria, we were doing about two to 300 million a year. So you add all of that up, we were at like 1.2, 1.3 billion a year in diverse spend. And again, I walked into that. So learned contracts and procurement stuff there, learned supplier diversity here. Um, had some incredible mentors, um, was able to figure out and learn a lot about the BDR and how that whole thing works and everything. Um, cut my teeth there for a while and was like, okay, I, I think I'm ready for the big leagues. Altria was splitting up. They spun craft off because the stock price was suffering because of its association with tobacco. Um, and then they broke up Philip Morris, international and domestic, because people smoke way more overseas than they do here. So that stock price was suffering. You break up all the kids, there's no need for a parent company, there's nobody parent. So they were getting rid of Altria. 
I went to NBC Universal, where I finally got to run my own supplier diversity program. When I walked in the door, NBC was doing about 70 million in diverse spend. When I left, they were doing 500 million. Um, and now I'm at baseball, same scenario. When I walked in, they were at about 60 million. Um, we'll hit, we'll hit five this year. We'll hit five this year. <laughs> um, sports is different. The franchises are basically their own companies, right? I, it's super decentralized. I don't get to tell anybody anything. I beg, I plead, I strong arm, I pit them against each other. But at the end of the day, they have their own ownership, their own CEOs, their own CFOs, all the way down. Each team is its own company. Um, I spent easily the first two or three years just building a rapport with them. They weren't listening to me at all. I have, I've had CFOs literally hang up the phone on me and say, don't call back here again. Um, they didn't want to expose their books. They didn't want to give me access to the decision makers. They didn't want to do any of that. So I've been there seven years. Literally, the first three was just making friends and playing nice. Um, so we've been rocking and rolling ever since. Um, but walked you through my career path that's got me here now. Every one of those organizations, every one of the, my education, everything was a unique experience to me. Um, the way I think and the way I look at things is going to be super different than anyone else, even people that look like me, right? So the idea and concept of bias and unconscious bias um, really is around how do you sometimes get out of your own way? You see things through a certain lens. Maybe sometimes you need to take those particular glasses off and look at things a different way. Um, so we're gonna walk through some of these things, but I wanna get, again, I'm, I'm timing myself. Crap. <laughs> um, so what is it, right? It's, again, we've talked about it, and I'm not gonna read all of this. I wanna get to this bottom part, because it is assessments and judgments. Like, let's be clear, it is your opinion, but it's yours. You're projecting it onto someone else, but it's yours. You might say, you know what, I really want to do business with this vendor, but the CEO, he's, he's got a bald head and a beard. And I hate guys that have bald heads and beards. I just, why, why don't you just shave the beard off? I don't get it. <laughs> I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. What? You don't even realize you're doing it. But some way, somehow, some part of your life, that influenced you and maybe, I don't know, some guy with a bald head and beard took your ex-girlfriend. I don't, I don't know what it is. I, I, I don't know what it is, but it shaped you. And all this is asking you to do is be cognizant of it. Half of this entire, if you take nothing else away from this entire conversation, it's really about being self-aware. It's not about anybody else. It's about you being self-aware when you're making certain decisions. We're exposed to as many as 11 million pieces of information at any one time. The brain can only handle 40. That means the rest of it, you, it's happening in your head. Again, you walked in this room, you looked at the carpet, you looked at the lighting, you looked at the projector, you looked at the laptop, you looked at the people, you looked at the chairs. You don't even realize you're doing it. You're doing all this stuff every second, in a split second. And it's shaping the way you feel at that particular moment. So imagine what happens when you, so this afternoon there's matchmakers, right? What's gonna happen if the room's too cold? Or what's gonna happen if the room's too hot? Or what's gonna happen if you hated lunch? Or what's gonna happen if you've got a phone call or a conference call coming up or you're thinking about what's for dinner tonight? Everything is happening all at the same time and this poor vendor sits in front of you. <laughs> and he's like, something seems off. I can't quite figure out what is. She's thinking about what's for dinner tonight. <laughs> like, so understand, and again, nothing else but be aware of it as you're making decisions, especially ones that impact the business. Um, so there's different types of unconscious bias, and I want to walk through these again. Awareness, right? Awareness and education. The first is affinity bias, which is they remind you of yourself. They remind you of yourself. And I don't know if you can see this, but you know, they're hiring a guy that looks like exactly like them. 
We do that all the time. We gravitate towards what we know and what's familiar to us. That doesn't mean what's unfamiliar to us isn't, isn't, is bad. It's just we gravitate towards what we're familiar with. This happens in hiring all the time, right? This is what diversity and inclusion in the workforce is all about. You keep hiring the same person. You keep hiring the folks that went to the same school as you. You keep hiring the ones that look like you. That doesn't, if somebody doesn't look like you, doesn't mean they're not qualified. You gotta be aware of this type of bias. Confirmation bias. And this is, this is, this is literally the entire, all of the whole internet. <laughs> you Google something, the first thing that pops up supports exactly what you're thinking. Every time, all the time. Because it's based on your previous searches. So if you went go looking for, I don't know, beige shoes, Guess what happens the next time you come back into the internet and you type something? Beige shoes are going to pop up. Confirmation bias says, whatever I already believe, I'm looking for something to go support it. Doesn't mean what I believe is right. Right? It just says, something out there, somebody out there is going to side with me, and therefore I'm absolutely going to believe what I think is right. Small, diverse businesses can't handle the work. Let me go see what the internet says. Hey, small businesses suck. I'm done. That's it. It works. I'm right. No need to even factor them in. Conformity bias. This is just peer pressure. And this happens in conference rooms, right? If any conference room, I say this all the time, if any, you walk past a conference room and there's all of one type of person around that conference table, guaranteed the best decision is not coming out of that room. If it's all men, somebody go get a woman, please, for a different perspective. If it's all white guys, go get anybody, I don't care, other than you, to help make a better decision and it's solely from the perspective of different experiences. Halo effect. We see one great thing about a person, therefore that person must be awesome. He went to Columbia, therefore he must be perfectly equipped to give this presentation. Well, that one's kind of true. I mean, it is kind of true. I mean, let's talk about it. Come on now, thank you. <laughs> um, and then Horn's effect, the opposite. We see one bad thing about a person, therefore they must be bad. If you saw this guy in a bar on Saturday night, and then Monday when you went to the hospital to have an operation and he showed up, you'd be like, hold on, wait, <laughs> hold on, come on, we'd all do it. We would all do it. Nothing's wrong with this guy. My arms are completely sleeved with tats. Does that make me unqualified to have, to have this discussion? But we do it. And again, all I'm asking is that you be aware of it. These are the things that prevent you from making every kind of decision at work, every day. And we talk, again, we talk about it all the time from a hiring perspective. We never talk about it from a supply chain perspective. We never say, oh, the CEO showed up to the matchmaker looking like this. <laughs> There's no way I'm giving this guy business. Maybe where he works, that's appropriate dress. Maybe because he works like this, he's actually outperforming everyone else in his industry. It's super situational, but that's the point. We come up, we come up with these blanket assessments and judgments, and again, based on stuff we went through, you don't even know the guy yet. You have not even talked to him one bit. You formed your own opinion based on I don't know, the one time you got a little tipsy and you went to the tattoo parlor yourself. <laughs> we all did it, come on, come on. Um, so, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you're not, I don't wanna say you're not being fair, but because again, it's your own assessment, right? And it's your own perspective based on your own experience. But what we are trying to do is come up with the answers to how you remedy some of that. So of course, let's walk through how it applies to directly to supplier diversity. Um, and all of these folks are stakeholders in your success with supplier diversity. 
right? You've got the actual procurement department. You've got your internal champions, which means they're already on your team. The champions, the people you know you can go count on. But those same people, they have their own biases going on in their head. Um, then you've got the decision makers, the ones that are actually cutting the checks, the suppliers themselves, and then you. Yeah, we want to talk about you too. Um, so we've all heard these things. You know, the game where you draw the line to who says what. Um, diverse businesses are too small. Decision makers say that, right? Let's, let's talk about ourselves. Sometimes we say it. I can't find any. That, that's a famous one, right? Procurement says that. The decision makers say that. Everybody says that one. <clears throat> I won't even get into set-asides. I'm not even going to do it. Um, reverse discrimination. We've all heard that. So um, when I was at NBC, I went to a staff meeting. That was one of my tactics to kind of get people aware. I would just tack myself on 10 minutes at the end of a staff meeting. Um, and this was our facilities group. So at the end of, the, en end of their meeting, I had a conversation with them, just walked them through what supply diversity is and what it was. I wasn't asking them for anything. It was more education and awareness. And I was explaining the different buckets, women, minority, LGBT, uh, breaking it all down. Um, and explaining how ethnicity trumps gender. So that if you are a Hispanic woman, owner of a company, I count you as Hispanic. So I don't double count my spend with you. I don't want to put you in a Hispanic bucket and put you in a women bucket. I put you in Hispanic. That means the women category ends up being white women only. Because if you are a woman of color, I put you in the color. That means LGBT is white men. Because if you're a gay black man and you own a company, I put you in the African American bucket. So I don't double count the spend. I went through this whole exercise, right, of explaining, this, this is a bunch of construction guys, right? This is the facilities department. A bunch of construction guys. One guy says, oh, so if I wanted to make money from NBC, all I had to do was just go out, start my own company, and say I was gay? <laughs> now, I wanted to jump across the table and punch him in the face, right? Because now you're making homophobic remarks in a corporate setting. Um, but he was listening. I was happy as hell. You're an idiot. I want to punch you. Your biases are making you say the ridiculous things coming out of your mouth, but you paid attention enough that you got what I was saying. My job's done. Thank you, folks, for your time. I walked the hell out. You're an idiot. We get that. But you listened. That's all I wanted. Um, I want to talk about it's the right thing to do, because we hear this a lot. And I, this was a huge pet peeve of mine. I've, I've gotten out of my own way in terms of biases. Um, right thing to do, take supply diversity, and it likens it to charity, to, philan to philanthropy and social responsibility. And a lot of our corporations have a corporate social responsibility arm, and usually supply diversity sits in procurement. Here's the problem with it's the right thing to do. Um, I'll give you an example. Let's say it's your head of IT, and he's got a bid out, I don't know, $100,000, $50,000, $50,000 bid for IT. He's got two vendors, they're equal footing, um, one's diverse, one isn't. Okay, we got that. $50,000 bid, two vendors, one diverse, one isn't. Head of IT. Coming up is, pick something. EMSDC Gala, black tie, table costs $50,000. If in his brain, buying a table to a dinner is the same as selecting a vendor that's going to do business for you, a business decision is not the same as going out to celebrate a cause and EMSDC was the wrong thing. Boys and Girls Club. Pick something. I, NAACP, 100 black men. Pick any organization. If those two things are the same in his brain, you've lost. 
because he'll buy the table and thinks he's satisfied a diversity request. When the reality is, this was a business decision you were making on for the organization that had bottom line implications that you said, well, we can give it to the other guy because I just bought a table for the same amount of money. Buying a table was the right thing to do. Support a cause. With you all day on that. No problem with that. This was a business decision that you just screwed up because in your brain, supplier diversity is the right thing to do. Everybody kind of see that? And that happens all the time because folks walk around saying, oh, it's the right thing to do, which it is, but for very different reasons. It's the right thing to do because it's a cost savings mechanism and it impacts your bottom line and it, in it creates innovation and it helps your company gain market share and a whole bunch of business reasons why it's the right thing to do, not because it's charity and you and nine of your work coworkers get to go out and put on tuxes for a night. Not the same. <clears throat> all right, so how do we kind of deal with all of this in the workplace? So the first thing I want to do is set the tone, right? I want to talk about it. We got to talk about this stuff. The same way we're doing it here, you got to talk about it at work. And diversity is a hard conversation to have at work. Right? Nobody wants to talk about that. Why? Because it brings up stuff that they learned when they were eight years old. And you don't want to talk about that. Like, oh, well, yeah, my dad did kind of say this in the household. But we got to talk about it, especially in a business setting. Because now we're talking about dollars. And that's the actual conversation. This is about <laughs> diversity of thought, but how it implicates the business. That's all this is. I'm not afraid to call a white man white. That's not a bad thing. And the white should be afraid to call me black or Hispanic. You guys heard the first pitch. Come on, stay with me. Um, that's not a bad thing. How you say it, obviously, might get you popped in the mouth, but it's not a bad thing to have the conversation. Um, and then obviously, so not making it bad, you got to be self-aware about what you're saying and how you say it and the decisions you're making as a result of it. Again, two exact vendors, both super capable, and you chose one over the other, why? Be cognizant of why you made that decision. Um, again, most supplier diversity is separate from DNI. Everybody, they, most supplier diversity sits in procurement. DNI is over here doing hiring bodies, doing a bunch of other stuff. If you're not leveraging DNI, um, you should be. Go have a conversation with your chief diversity officer tomorrow. She's got budget, first of all, like a whole lot of it um, that you might be able to tap into. So now leverage the right thing to do narrative, right? Again, huge pet peeve. We understand the difference now, but if somebody is bought in because of this concept, don't turn them away and say, oh, you're thinking about this wrong. Screw you. No, use them. Use them. Educate them but use them. They're, they're halfway there. They just need that little push that says, okay, let me, let me just wipe the lens clean for you a little bit, show you these new views, um, and let's move forward. And then matter over mind and matter is the money. I mean, clearly this entire conversation from a supplier diversity perspective is never about color. It's never about gender. It's always about money. Always about money. Your supply chain impacts your bottom line. This is always about either your suppliers are helping you make money or they're helping you save money. You can make a million dollars, but if you spend 999,000 of it, you still broke as hell, right? So they're either shrinking that cost factor for you or they're figuring out ways to impact costs and help you make money. I do rev share deals all the time with our suppliers. Um, is that it? Am I done? Oh, no. A little bit more. Come on. Right, time check. Crap. <laughs> 10 minutes. We're good. Um, okay, so business case. It's getting warm. All right. These three say the exact same thing, just different ways. And depending on who I'm talking to, they either love one or hate the other or not. I don't know why. It's just audience preferences. They say the exact same thing. So let's walk through them. This is the supplier diversity business case. Um, first one. So this talks about, again, the money, right? 
supply diversity started way back when. It was about affirmative action. It was about um, using government quotas. It was about taking all of that, that model and moving it to the corporate space. So it was about compliance. It was about the right thing to do back then. It was about you know, giving back to the community. And not that any of that is bad, but supply diversity is now about the money. It's about how do we increase revenue. It is about market penetration, um, promoting good citizenship, driving innovation. When I was at NBC, I had the sales department call me. Sales never calls procurement, much less supplier diversity. So sales calling you was like a big deal. And the guy was on the phone, he was like, um, you do supplier diversity for us, right? I'm like, you called me, dude, to hell. Um, <laughs> um, and he's like, okay, well, um, NBC broadcasts the Super Bowl. He's like, I'm trying to land Walmart to do a 30 second commercial for the Super Bowl, $2 million is on the line, and they're asking us what we do for, for diversity. I'm like, oh, you need me. <laughs> Sales had nothing to do with diversity ever, $2 million bucks on the line for a 30 second commercial, and now he's calling. Abs let's leverage that. Let's, I gave him everything he needed. He didn't get, I think he got a million, but he didn't get two. Um, sales calling you, you're doing your job. Because now that's the money. That's the money. If sales is calling or if you have a relationship with your sales department, you need to hold on to that for dear life. Um, that's the new model for supply diversity. It isn't the right thing to do. Um, Supply diversity creates a network of business partners that are highly representative of your customers' expectations. In that particular case, Walmart was the customer. And they wanted to know, if I'm going to give you all my money, what are you guys doing? Because we, Walmart, we've got an awesome supply diversity program. We've got an awesome diversity and inclusion initiative. What the hell are you doing? Um, same concept, sort of. This basically says, look, if the money goes out the door, it comes back in. So, you hire a diverse business to do something, whatever. Um, as a result, let's say the rep that landed the account, landed MLB as an account, he gets a promotion. Good job, you landed MLB. Now to service the account, we gotta hire two people. So just in landing one deal, this guy's now making more money and two people got a job. Like, we talk about unemployment rate in this country all the time, right? One account, they just hired two people. Everybody now has extra income. The guy that got promoted, the two people now have a new job, they're making some extra cash, disposable income in their community when they take it back home, in their household. Guess what they might do with some of their extra cash? Come to a baseball game. The money went out the door, comes right back. When I show this to our CFOs, I, I swear they wet their pants. They were like in love. <laughs> I could have talked to them about here's the spend and here's this and here's that. They don't want to hear that crap. What we're doing with women owned businesses. They don't want to hear that. That's the wrong audience for that message. But I talked to them about the dollar coming right back to us and they're all in. They, they, they're talking about, well, we got to raise our ticket prices next year because we're not making as much money as we want to. And I say, look, Keep the ticket price flat. You want butts and seats? Don't raise the ticket price. Let me go work on the cost. Again, you make a million dollars, but if you're spending all of it, so let me go work on the cost. You don't raise your ticket prices. It might not put more butts and seats. It might actually lose some. Let me go work on That's the conversation that they want to hear. They don't care how I do it. As long as I'm saving them money, black companies, Asian companies, women companies, gay companies, go for it, do it. I don't care. Know your audience. Next one. Um, and then this one says the exact same thing as the other two, except it's got the word ROI in it. For some people, they need to see that on the screen. I, I don't know why. Some people need ROI in their lives. Like, I get it, but it doesn't change what I'm talking about. The money goes out. The ROI is that the money comes right back in. It's just presented differently. Um, fine, the ROIs will increase our diverse spend, right? We can tout that, report it, get a press release, do all this fancy stuff, which can help us gain market share and do a bunch of other things. Um, cost savings, obviously, impact the bottom line. Increase revenue, these two impact the bottom line. I've done rev share deals with diverse businesses. Um, they've come in, to replaced an incumbent, and part of the deal was if they hit a certain target, I get some points on that. 
nice and easy. They're happy they got a new gig and we're happy because they hit their target, which will now help them. We're incentivized to do. We get a piece. Okay, I'm done with that one. Um, I, now I think I'm done. Ah, crap, no. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know, this says exactly what I was saying. Again, create a network of partners that represent your customer, right? But to do that, you need to not have biases about your customer. Let, look, I shouldn't say this because this is being recorded, but I'm going to talk about MLB for a second. Our problem is the stigma is that only white people come to baseball games. Let's talk about it, right? We don't have enough diversity in our fan experience. Um, in certain markets, it's true. In certain markets, I can't give away a baseball ticket. Like, I, I've tried, trust me. Um, but if we need to make our customers' expectation different of us, then internally we have to do different things. Our supply chain needs to look like our customers. Our marketing needs to look like our customers. Every aspect of our business needs to look like our customers. So if we're complaining about diversifying our fan base, what the hell are we doing to proactively diversify our fan base? Um, tie your company's profits and core business to supplier diversity. Supplier diversity spends a lot of time working on the ancillary stuff. It's, it's part of the business operations, but it's not the business. When I was at NBC, I didn't work on deals that were related to on air or making a movie until I pushed that needle. I was doing all the ancillary stuff. I was doing promotional projects and all the giveaways and all, like, all the easy stuff. No, I want to go talk to a producer. Somebody get Will Smith on the line. I wish I could say that. That, was, that, that, that's, that sounded cool. I've, I've never actually said that. <laughs> um, but those are the kinds of conversations. So whatever that is. So for baseball, last year when the, the, the league changed the rule and now we all have to take the nets all the way out, because remember the little kid got hit with the baseball, the net used to just be behind home plate. Oh, I was at the table. Okay, let's go find a diverse company to help do that. There aren't any, let's go create one. At least get an opportunity to bid. Now that's the game. That's not promotional products. The netting is the game. So the minute diversity starts to impact the core business profitably, you're golden. Um, supply diversity and a procurement of interchangeable terms, that's hard, right? Because um, that really requires you stepping away from your biases and saying that diverse vendors are no different from anyone else. Um, and that's super tricky because then what the hell do I have you for? But the flip side of that, so I just dealt with this because um, we were going to do an early payment thing you know, pay the vendors in 10 days to help them sustain and keep. And the model that we were developing, it was only going to go to diverse businesses, and I stopped it. Because if you treat them like they're a charity case and they need the cash flow and no one else does, you're always going to look at them as small and incapable. So if you're going to roll this out, I'm all for an early payment process, you got to roll it out to everybody. Don't treat them like they need help. That's actually not helping them. And when it was initially presented, everybody thought they were doing a great idea. It would think, everybody thought it was awesome. Let's do this, this works, it makes sense. We, the right thing to do. That's because you're looking at them like the charity. Let them stand on their own too, like anybody else. So as MBEs, they play that fence, right? Like, no, help me, please. Oh, but then no, I can compete with the big boys. Why don't you give me the big bid? Nah, pick one, man. Pick one. Pick it and stick on it. That, that pick a side and stay there. You want to rock with the big boys? You're going to play with the big boys. Do not ask me to pay you early. You wait the net 30, which is really 90, <laughs> like everybody else. Pick one. You can't have it both ways. So this is, should be real. It's also dangerous. Please tell me I'm done now. <laughs> yes! All right. Questions, comments. You liked what I said. You completely disagree. I don't know why I sat through this for 50 minutes. Go ahead. Loved it. Actually. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the, that. It, the one challenge that is 
universal in this is when you say it's unconscious bias. Yes! How do we... You made it. I was on the time. <laughs> How do we... You know, it's like, okay, we'll be self-aware. Well, yep. The point is that we, we're not self-aware. So what do we do to help ourselves become more self-aware to identify these unconscious biases? Absolutely. Bring them to the consciousness. Um, so I think self-awareness... Look, you've got to kind of be in touch with yourself, right? Like, I know my... I know my shortcomings. Um, but that's a tough conversation that you're willing to have that other people may not be willing to have. Like if I go home and I talk to my, my parents about my therapy, right. I want to have that conversation and they don't. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm suggesting that you need to have it with yourself is actually what I'm saying, especially if you're in a position to kind of make decisions. Like you need to be aware of why you're making the decisions. Only once you get to that point, in my opinion, um, can you then really have a conversation with someone else and says, you know what, my opinion differs. Because again, it's okay to have a differing opinion. Here's why. You're not actually trying to convince them. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to sway a bunch of people on my side. You are who you are. I'm just asking you to think about it. That's, that's, that's all this is. Again, the premise of diversity is that we are all different. I don't need you to be me. I don't need you to agree with me. I need you to be understanding and respectful of mine, in my opinion. That's it. As long as I get that, we don't have to agree. We can go sit down and have a drink and debate all day. I think where it gets tricky is when the decision makers aren't even aware of the reasons why they're making these decisions. The entire legal department all look the same and all came from the same school. Dude, there's a bunch of awesome lawyers somewhere else. Go get them. Right? So that's the conversation. Um, but it, again, it starts with that self-awareness. Like, I know I'm super candid. Like, probably way too candid. It's actually hurt me in my career. I don't, I got no filter. I'm surprised I didn't curse. And the only reason I didn't curse is because this was being recorded. Like, I, but I know these things about me. You know, and, and it then shapes not only the conversations I have, but when I meet somebody and I see it in somebody else, CEOs of businesses, I don't, it's not a strike, but it's self-awareness. I see it. Fine, you probably shouldn't have cursed in this matchmaker, <laughs> but I get it, man. I get it. You're passionate about what you, what you do. So am I. And sometimes there's no filter when you're passionate. So it's just the self-awareness part. I'm not saying convince. I'm saying just be aware. I don't know if that helped. Paul. Yeah, actually that's a question that comes up a lot in the recruiting space. Yeah. On the DNI side. Yeah. And uh, two things that's usually recommended. First of all, you have to become more educated about the space you're operating in. So self-awareness is easy to say, but for you to understand what you're doing is to become more educated by learning about your space. Yep. But secondly, very important, is to have someone who's diverse with you to help you make those decisions because we all have biases. There are things that you can see that, that I can't and vice versa. So it's important to have someone in a room who thinks and sees things differently. Yep. And it helps to cut down a lot of those unconscious biases, sometimes even conscious biases. That happens in that. Great point. So two things about that. One, that's called cultural agility, right? So especially a lot of um, big companies, when they send people overseas, right? You get, you get dropped in this culture that you don't know anything about, and you don't know the language, and you don't know, like, expats, they come back, and they have a completely different view on the world, having been immersed in some culture they didn't know anything about for a four-month <laughs> assignment. Um, you don't know the language. So... And a lot of them, before they go, they get educated and they get training. They'll take a quick language course. They'll learn about the city, the politics, the religion. There's nothing to say you can't do that in your own backyard. Expats, when they are sent on assignment, they get ready. You should be getting ready as a part of your everyday life. You're going to interact with people that are not like you. And again, I don't want to get political or even bring up religion or any of that stuff. But, you know, we hear things about other religions, Muslims. and If you have not educated yourself on what that actually is, 
then you're just buying whatever somebody's feeding you. And then to Paul's second point, yeah, a lot of times when those folks get dropped on assignment overseas, there's either somebody waiting for them when they get there to hold their hand and make sure they don't screw it up, or they're going with somebody that is familiar with the territory. Same concept. You get sent on an assignment for work overseas, you got to get ready. It's cultural agility. Um, yeah. So to add to the conversation to the gentleman's question, in self-awareness, you have to look at it in like a two-fold process. So there's emotional intelligence mm -hmm. and unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. There's a relationship between there. Yep. So when you're trying to build that bridge, being aware of yourself and having self-control and having self-awareness, it allows you to be more open to engaging in different cultures. That's from minorities, women, veterans, disabled, different cultures and even different relationships that will allow you to bridge that gap and to see the relationship between emotional intelligence and unconscious bias. Yep. Because once you become open with yourself, that mitigates a lot of the biases that you have mm -hmm. to be open and subjected to what, what other people see for who they are and what you see for who they are the reverse. Right, beyond, the, beyond your lens, yeah. Um, Self-aware, emotional intelligence, I, emotional intelligence is its own topic, like by itself. And if any of you have not taken an emotional intelligence test, um, I recommend that you do so. It will teach you a lot of things about yourself. Um, and it puts you on this grid and depending on what your personality is, it, it literally lists out traits and you, it's surprising how answering 50 questions if you answer them honestly you learn so much about yourself um so for those that have not i highly highly recommend it it it, it just you'll read this thing and you're like mm, yeah i don't want to admit it but that's me um so but it also highlights your strengths as well so it, it it's very a very powerful and useful tool <laughs> To, to add on to that, yep. even, even with the cultural rotation training as an expat yep. in India for four months, I had all the training, yep. prepare, it is prepared yep. as it can be to go there. Until you're there and yeah. living in the culture, yeah. you still yeah. don't understand. Without the a doubt. Um, without so a doubt. There has to be that experience. Absolutely. And you're right. Coming back, completely changed that yeah. for the rest of my life. Yeah. On understanding it yeah. and being sensitive. No, I mean, look, again, I even experienced it in my personal life. Like, I, have, I still have family in Panama. I go there. I think I'm one of them. I'm speaking the language. And they look at me like, you freaking American. Like, what? Are you kidding me? What'd you just say? Like, so, but again, my awareness is I know. I claim it. I rep it. I'm, I, when I'm there, I'm a tourist. And I'm super aware of the fact that I'm a tourist. My cousins look out for me. They make sure I don't say the wrong thing. Um, no, you don't want to go talk to her. <laughs> um, but again, I'm aware of it. I'm not walking around like I own the place just because my parents are from there. Like, mistake number one, right? So emotional intelligence, self-awareness, call it what you want. It is really, again, if you take nothing away from this, your ability to just kind of understand or open your thought process to factor all things in and don't project your own stuff on someone else because that's what we're doing and again it, it impacts the business you guys I don't know how many of you have signed up for matchmakers this afternoon but hopefully this afternoon will be different for you now um, having sat through this so I don't know if there's any more questions. Oh, wow, yes. Uh, I'm a former player in the NFL, and one of the gaps that's there in, for the players is getting involved in the spending. Mm -hmm. spending. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you do an M MLB? As an MLB player, as a Major League Baseball players, do they, are they, you know, their association involved in encouraging spending? Do they have a DNI director? I know the NFL just hired, or is trying to hire a DNA. I got some from Troy Vincent the other day. That, uh, um, different worlds. Yeah. They don't intersect. Um, the Players Association yeah. would, yeah, no. <laughs> the answer is just no. <laughs> um, without giving away too much. Look, I, I know you're um, a yeah, right. I'm, I'm super you cognizant of that. Um, <laughs> The business model of sports is those guys are paid a whole lot of money to do one thing and do it well. Um, don't mess with them. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, you tap into them for 
um, branding and marketing purposes when it benefits the whole organization. Um, but look, honestly, um, we have done some trainings, usually at spring training. It's the one time where we can kind of get them all before the season actually starts, where we talk about entrepreneurship after their career. So look, you're not going to play this game forever, and baseball is different because you have a, a much longer playing time than the NFL for certain. Um, but we p position it as part of financial planning for them. But you know, once you're done, there are opportunities for either entrepreneurship, investment, a whole bunch of things. So we, we package it as that. But while they're playing, hands off. The PA doesn't take too kindly to it. Just so. one quick follow up. Does the, you know, the stadiums are built in yep. cities. Is there an encouragement <coughs> by MLB to be part of that uh, DNI strategy? For, for the players? Yeah. Not, uh, not for the players, but. But oh, no, no. Yeah. For us, yeah. yes. stadium yeah. operations is actually one of our biggest areas of spend from a diversity perspective. Um, and again, it varies from city to city because not in, in every city, the team doesn't own the stadium. In certain cities, the city owns the stadium. In certain cities, the stadium is privately owned by like a corporation or something. So this, it's not the same across the board. So depending on what that ownership structure looks like, um, the percentages will vary. So like Wrigley just went on, just went through five years of renovation, uh, $500 million in fixing Wrigley in Chicago. Um, the team put their own quota on themselves. The city didn't, they did, and they exceeded it. They had like a 35% diverse spend and they hit 42. So they, they knocked it out the park. <laughs> Pun intended. Um, it just happens now. I've been there too long. I, I don't even. I don't even see it coming. Um, there was another question. I'm sorry. So yep. Just uh, follow on to that. So when now that Wrigley is privately owned, right? Yep. So that wouldn't count in in, in your overall program. That's what this. What the, the, the no, it counts. Is. It does count. In it your does program? count. Okay. Their spend. Okay. Their their diverse spend counted. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I thought I saw another hand, but if not, oh yeah, 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 you. So, uh, thank you. <clears throat> so we have to get past the whole idea that these are entitlement programs, because that's not been helpful. Right. Many years, 50 years of supplier diversity. The needle has moved very little, yep. however. So we haven't done a lot of yep. supplier diversity. And if you do embrace the idea <laughs> that supplier diversity is a revenue enabler yep. with a positive ROI, yep. we've got to understand the fact that many 99% of these suppliers are solopreneurs. You know, they have yeah. one or two people. So by us not thinking <laughs> that we have to do supplier development to help Absolutely. Them improve us is really a big mistake. Absolutely. So, so yes, they do have to play with <laughs> the big boys. I love you. You've got to give them some help. So without a doubt. So a couple of things on that. Um, one, the new companies and new companies are companies since 2000, right? The Facebooks, the Spotify's, the Googles, the, the, the them, the internet and new companies approach it that way. It's all of us, the old ones, right? Baseball is over 100 years old. It's the, it's the IBMs. It's the, the big boys that have been doing this since the 60s when it was affirmative action. We have not updated our mindset. The new companies look at this completely differently. Um, second point is, and I shouldn't say this on camera, but I'm going to say it. The councils need to update um, their certification process. Um, there isn't much room for sole proprietorship, new types of industries, freelancers, all these new diverse businesses can't meet the certification requirements of the NMSDCs and the other organizations out there, those need to open up. I'm board chair for New York, New Jersey Council, and I'm like beating myself in the head as a, as, as a board member because, not especially in New York, but in New York, there's this new wave of diverse businesses coming up that are being attracted by the new companies that we, all of the older companies, are missing out on. And they're not getting certified. 
Let's just call it what it is. They're not getting certified. And I'm used to that in baseball. The, the majority of my vendors are not certified. Again, shouldn't be saying this at a council event, but um, it is what it is. Again, again, my candor gets me in trouble. <laughs> I can't, so quick story and then I'm gonna let you guys go. Um, so right down the block from the Yankees, right? There's a printer. This guy, old Hispanic man, his sole fortune is that literally his shop is a block away from Yankee Stadium. The Yankees use him for everything. I went and talked to this guy. I'm like, look, why don't you get certified? If you get certified, I'd bring you to Mets. That works in most situations, right? Growth, scale. He's like, get the hell out of here. Get, like, get out of my shop. He's like, are you kidding me? If you brought me another major league team, I'd have to run a third shift. I'd never be home to see my family. I'd be out of business in a year because my costs would go through the roof. His model is that he gets to go home and eat dinner with his family every night. And that works for him. He's not trying to grow. The concept of certification for him does not benefit him. There's no upside to it. <laughs> so unless we are factoring in or looking through their lens, again, bias, right? We're, we're talking about this. NMSDC has a bias about the value proposition of certification that stemmed from the 60s and 70s that may need some updating. Let me look into the camera as I say that. <laughs> <laughs> Dramatic pause. Um, I'm specifically referring to MLB and all the old companies. Yeah, no, it's everybody. It's and everybody. And Absolutely. But, is not, in my opinion, agreed, Ag agreed, totally agree. But the idea that you are developing them for a model that may or may not benefit them is what I'm suggesting. You have to update the overall model so that once they are developed, there's something for them, right? And if you're not working on, again, this is bias, right? Where you think you've got it all together and you just need to help somebody else. No, no, no. We got some stuff to do too. We need to fix our shop as we're fixing theirs. And it's doable, it's totally possible we just need to get out of our own way and say, okay, look, we need to clean up some of the stuff that we're doing. Or, or there's some innovation that has taken place that now requires us to pay some attention to. That's, that's all. Now, I, um, I want to just follow that up because you have to define what development is. What right. does development find that, define that as? You know, right. It's no longer, I'm going to help you write your business case or whatever. Right. Things of that nature. What does development look like in this, in, in, in this world today? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a, it's a different time. And... Yeah. There's different types of suppliers. I mean, another pet peeve of mine, I can keep talking forever, I hope you guys don't have anywhere else to go. Um, so another pet peeve of mine is procurement itself, right? And I talk about this all the time. Corporate procurement is such an archaic and outdated model. All of us, personally, in our lives, use Amazon. You can, two clicks on this thing and whatever I purchase, it'll be home before I get there. Yet at work, you're still filling out a requisition, even if it's online. The pink copy goes to this guy. The green copy goes to this person. The yellow copy goes over here. God forbid somebody's out and can't sign it. Like, who, who's still doing that? Why? So, right, no, we go, everybody does. No, that's, that's my point. That's exactly my point. But, so, so we're expecting all this new age stuff from our supply chain, but we ain't got our own crap together. We're still running around the building trying to chase a signature. Like, are you kidding me? Like, our own model is crap. <laughs> and then you want to layer diversity on top of that, but then expect the supplier to have all of their stuff together. Come on, get out of here. Are you kidding me? Like, again, let's, let's be self-aware, right? Let's own where we are falling short. Procurement, corporate procurement is super outdated. And as a result, we still have suppliers that are functioning in a system that they think works. The, these, these folks should be chasing blockchain and they should be doing all kinds of stuff, these MBEs. They should be doing a bunch of other things, but they, they're listening to us. Tell them what they should be doing and we're still running around. Can you, no, he's out today. I'll, I'll, it'll sit on my desk for four more days till he comes back from his business trip so he can sign a rec for $1,500. <laughs> Give me a break.
Meanwhile, I can order $1,500 worth of stuff on this. It's already got my credit card information on there. Everything's on here. And again, the box will be on my porch when I get home in real life. Like, we're not operating in the real world once we step into the walls of our business. But the expectations that we're putting on these suppliers is completely, do it doesn't align. And we're the ones calling shots? Give me a break. Okay, y'all got me saying way too much on camera. I'm shutting up. Thank you.